My name is Suzette Rasmussen, and um, I'm excited to be here. I want to talk to you all about some really um, important topics, which is what you're looking at is the life ahead of you, your careers, and how to plan for those. So um, I was going to start off with the first slide was finding your place in the world. So BYU, as you know, the motto is enter to learn, go forth to serve. And I wanted to reassure you all that you are investing wisely by being here at BYU. BYU will prepare you very well to go out into the world in whatever capacity you go into for your career, your home life, your community. You're being prepared very well. So have full confidence and faith that your time spent here is going to pay off down the road. So um, secondly, wanted to just share a little bit about who I am and my background. So first and foremost, I'm a wife and mom. And um, I have a blended family. So I started out with plan A that we all start out with in life and ended up different road, plan B. So I just want you to know life is going to take you on different uh, twists and turns and it will all work out. Plan B sometimes is way better than plan A ever would have been. So don't be afraid down your path to take a different road. So as a wife and mom, I, um, my undergraduate degree was in English, and I thought down the road I would want to be a mom, and the best degree I could get was in education and literature, and that way I could help my family in that capacity. I didn't plan to have a career outside of the home. I just thought, you know, this is going to be a good a basic foundation for my education. So I got my degree in English, and then I went on to certify to become a secondary teacher. And so before I had kids, I taught high school English, and I really, really enjoyed it, loved it, um, was passionate about it. Wanted to go to law school, but something told me it's not the time. Stay at home and start a family. So that's what I did. I took that route. So four kids later, I got the impression that I needed to go back to school. And again, I thought, OK, is this the time to go to law school? And it wasn't the time. I got the answer, nope, that's not it. Um, but I felt the need to get a graduate degree. And I didn't understand why. But I got that degree in educational leadership. And I thought, not sure what I'm going to do with this, but it felt right. So down the road a little bit further, um, I was a mom of four very small kids and got divorced and pretty quickly realized I needed to be the breadwinner for our family. So at that point, I had a big decision to make. OK, am I going to go back into teaching, or am I going to look for something else? And um, as appealing as it was to go back into teaching, because you get summers off, you get to be with your kids more, I realized I wouldn't be able to make it on a teacher's salary for the five of us. So I thought, OK, what else could I do with my undergraduate background and degree? And English, um, I thought, OK, I can be an editor. So I started applying for jobs as an editor. I got hired by a company to be an editor, and it was a, it's a multinational global company. And at that time, I thought, OK, I'll be an editor. Well, I quickly morphed into doing all of the marketing for the company. And then from there, I was made the director of marketing communications. So then I took on marketing and communications. Um, the opportunities just opened up. And that's one of the things I want to share with you is if you just get started and, and um, down the path, the opportunities will open up for you. So from that job led to another in um, in marketing and communications for a different global company. And at that time, I started to feel impressed that um, there was something more for me to do. Well, lo and behold, BYU knocked on my door and asked if I would start teaching a class. Um, and so I thought, well, I'm pretty busy. I have this corporate career during the day. And then I've got four kids that I'm mom and dad to. And um, I'll see what, what it looks like. So they let me teach one class a semester. Um, and it was a three-hour block. So once a week, I was teaching. And I did that for five years. So it was busy time of life, right? Um, well, five years after that, I got the impression it's time to go to law school. And I just thought, OK, this is crazy. How am I going to do that? And the 
feeling and that impression just kept coming back to me over and over. So I decided, all right, well then I'll go with this. I'll take the LSAT. I had no time to prepare for the LSAT because I had a full-time career and I was adjunct faculty here at BYU and raising my four kids on my own. Um, so three weeks before the LSAT test, I'm like, all right, I'll go buy a workbook, read through it, and see if, I, you know, I won't score well enough to get admitted. So then that will be the end of that feeling to go to law school. So um, I took the LSAT, and the test scores came back, and I did fine. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I'll apply. I'll apply to BYU Law School, but there's no way I'll get admitted. They're not going to take this older mom who, you know, didn't, do the traditional career path. I've been a stay-at-home mom, and then now I'm in a career, but it has nothing to do with the law. So I'll see, that'll be the end of that. So I applied, and miracles of miracles, I was admit admitted to BYU Law School. So then I thought, okay, this must you know, be what I'm supposed to be doing. So the first day comes around for orientation, and I get the strongest impression, this is not the time for you to be in law school. And I thought, oh my goodness, I went to all this effort to take the LSAT, which is brutal, and to go through the admissions process, and now I'm getting the you know, answer that this isn't the right time. So the first day of orientation, I talk to the dean and say, I can't do law school this year. I just need to wait. And so I thought that'll be the end of that. Well, no, the dean said, we'll hold your spot come next year. And I thought, wow, OK, that's great. So the next year rolls around, and once again, I got the answer, nope, this isn't the right time for you. So again, I go to the dean and say, I can't do law school this year. And he's like, all right, we'll hold your spot. And I thought, this is incredible. Maybe I really am supposed to be going to law school. So the following year, I finally got the answer, this is the right time for you. And so I attended BYU Law School, and um, now we can get started. Um, This is my family, so blended family. So everybody on one side is are my kids, and then the others are my husbands. So you can see there's a lot of us, but it's so much. It's it's honestly the best career path ever, wife and mom. Um, I'll backtrack now that we have the presentation up. So currently, I practice law. I work for Freeman Lovell. It's a business and real estate law firm in um, the Salt Lake area. And I do transactional and litigation, which is a little different. Usually people do one or the other, but we're a small law firm, and so we do both. And I was, one, I was the first woman that the law firm hired. So um, we now have another female attorney on staff, but it's a great law firm. I work from home, which is fantastic. Um, technology has really changed everything. It allows us to be able to service our clients um, remotely and virtually in so many ways. So it's been fantastic. So if you're wanting to know what transactional law looks like, it's a lot of contracts. So um, mergers and acquisitions, when somebody wants to buy a business, somebody wants to sell a business, we prepare all of the paperwork for that. Regulatory compliance, that means like if a state agency um, has to license you, that you have to comply by the state's rules and laws on how to maintain that license. Construction contracts, real estate contracts, negotiations. I've also practiced some family law and criminal law because in business matters, when people divorce and they own a business, they need to sell off that business and those assets. And criminal law, employers a lot of times will have employees that have criminal matters that need to be addressed in order for them to stay on. And so um, employment law is another big area. Entity formation, when somebody wants to form and organize a business and company and how to run that, um, there are laws that state how you should run a business in the state. And then also we do litigation. So inevitably, some of the businesses that we do transactional work for end up in a contract dispute and um, we need to file a lawsuit or defend a lawsuit for them. So one of the things I hope that you'll take away from today is that your mission here on Earth is personal. It's about you and you finding your own path, not someone else's. And I really, really hope to impress you with the idea that you don't need to worry if your path is different. It will all work out, and it will be your path. Now, a lot of you are political science majors, 
So a lot of different topics and words probably jump out at you. You have a lot of options on what to do with your career, a lot of different paths that you can take. Don't be afraid to find the one that's right for you. Now to tell you a little bit about my path to the legal and international career started early. So when I was really young, my family lived in El Paso, Texas, which is a border town next to Juarez, Mexico. And when I was very little, my parents would load up the station wagon and we would drive across the border and deliver clothing and toys and other household items that the people there who were living in extreme poverty would need. And that left me with such an impression about how people live in different parts of the world. This was just across the border, and yet they lived so drastically differently than us. Then when I was a teenager, um, I was able to go on a trip to different Asian countries, and again, there was extreme poverty. And that struck me on how, because of opportunity, people can live such different lives. And so that is really where I developed an interest and a love for international and for people and for seeing that people can make a change in society around the world. So when, with my own kids, I felt like it was really important to help them develop those same attributes of love for other people and cultures and wanting to make a positive impact in this world. And so since we're, they were very young, I started taking them on humanitarian trips around the world. And we would find different ways to go and serve people so that they could be exposed to the needs in the world and so that they could realize how much we have here in the United States and how blessed we are. And this daughter right here, Sarah, um, is, she graduated with her degree in political science. And I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about her in a little bit. But that sense of volunteering and serving others stayed with me even in law school. And the reason why I have this slide up is because I want to talk to you about how you're going to get people telling you, no, that's not the right way to get there. This is what you need to do. But you need to listen to your gut because your gut's going to tell you what's right for you. So when I was going through law school, your first summer of after your first year of law school, you're traditionally supposed to go work for a law firm so that then you can learn how the law firm works and then the next summer they'll hire you again and then you'll have a job after law school. That's kind of the goal, right? Have a job after. Well, BYU Law School is very unique in the sense that the church offers what they call legal externships. And so the church has um, area legal councils attorneys who go and serve around the world overseeing the affairs of the church in different parts of the world. And BYU Law School will send um, a handful of students each summer to go and work there. It's a volunteer experience, so it's not paid, and it's not going to lead to a job, um, but I thought this is an incredible opportunity to get to see another part of the world and to learn how lawyers can help make an impact in the world and also to learn more about how the church runs its organization worldwide. So the first summer I went to New Zealand and, and served there in the church's area legal office council in um, Auckland. And then the second summer came around. And again, that's when you traditionally are supposed to go work for a law firm so that you get that experience and then they hire you afterwards. But again, the prompting I got was, no, I'm supposed to go and do another externship for the church. And at this point, the career services office was like, no, you can't do that. You're not going to get hired. You need to get some different experience. But I felt really strongly that this is what I was supposed to do. And so the church's area legal council for New Zealand um, was talking to the one from the that's overseas the Carib Caribbean islands. And he said, yeah, I'd love to have her come. And so I went and spent that summer in the Dominican Republic. Um, helping with the church's legal matters there. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity because you have everything come across your desk. You can imagine um, the area legal council there, they're, they're responsible for overseeing property acquisition, land acquisition to get church buildings um, built and temples. And they also have missionaries who are going out and doing 
things they shouldn't be doing. So then you're dealing with criminal matters in that country, and there's all kinds of different um, employment law issues because the church hires people around the world. Um, so from property matters to uh, criminal law matters to employment issues, we saw it all, and it was a great experience to learn and see um, how the organization works around the world. But as I mentioned, the law school was telling me, that's not how you're going to get a job. You've got to do this, this, and that. But I felt I trusted my gut, and I went with it. And those two summers I spent um, doing the legal externships, the volunteer service opportunities. Well, lo and behold, when I got out of law school, I did get a job, and not just any job. Basically, like the best job in the entire state. I got to be the staff attorney for the governor. So listen to your gut. <laughs> It was a great opportunity and great position. I loved it. Um, I'm so grateful for the, the privilege to serve with our governor. So if you're not from Utah, um, this is our governor, our current governor, and his name is Governor Gary Herbert, and he was a fantastic person to work for, and I got the opportunity to learn all about how government works on a state level, and it was an incredible opportunity. I worked closely with them on legislation. So right now, it's Utah's legislative session. So the legislators are in session right now at Capitol Hill. And they are drafting and writing all the laws for our state. They're amending some, they're repealing some, and they're drafting new ones. Um, and so the governor, as you probably are aware, is the, the one that gets to sign and approve those laws after the legislature does their part, or he vetoes them. So we had to analyze and review and research all of the proposed legislation during the session so that when it did come to the governor's desk at the end of the session, we could advise him on, yes, you should sign this law, or uh, that one is a veto, or you know what, this one you may want to not sign it, but just let it pass into legislation. I also got to work on the state's administrative rules. So each state agency writes rules to comply with the statutes, the laws that were enacted. And so that's, um, that's a big job because there's a lot of state agencies and also serve as the records officer for the governor's office. So in the state of Utah, there's a law that states that if you want access to any public record, you can request that access for that information. And so any request for information that for the governor's information would come to me and I'd have to classify it. Um, so it was a great opportunity. My next um, job after being the governor's staff attorney was to work for the World Trade Center Utah. And in this, I just wanted to stress the importance of being proactive. So the reason why I was able to get this job was because of the people that I met, the connections that I made, and just proactively seeking out a job with them. I actually approached the person who at that time was the CEO and just said, hey, I really, really love doing international work. And I know that the World Trade Center Utah does the international work on behalf of the state. Do you have any positions or can you kind of guide me in you know, anything that would lead towards that? And uh, fortunately, the CEO at the time of the World Trade Center had previously been the governor's chief of staff. And so he was thrilled and said, yeah, come join the team. So um, I was able to be there for two and a half years. And the World Trade Center Utah gave me many, many great opportunities to see international business um, and to be part of that. So what we did at the World Trade Center Utah was to help businesses grow globally. So that means we would let business owners know, hey, you know, whatever product or service you're offering here locally, you should consider taking that beyond the borders and have a global outreach. Because, um, as you can see from this map, 95% of sales opportunities lie outside of the United States. So just think what that would do for that particular business if it could grow outside of just the US. And then just think what that could do for Utah's economy if all of the businesses started to grow internationally. So. Um, the global middle class is growing. As you're probably aware, you can see how much um, the changes have happened in the last 10 years. And only 1% of US companies are exporting. So we're not doing great on that area. And that's one of the things that we wanted to let businesses be aware of, that it can be pretty daunting to 
take your business outside of U.S. borders because you're dealing with different currencies, you're dealing with different languages, you're dealing with different customs, and you're dealing with different laws. But um, the exporting of goods and services is, is vital to our global economy today. So this job allowed me to have many international opportunities. So we would take business owners on trade shows to exhibit their products, and we would go all over the world doing this to help them be able to showcase their products to the world. And then we also did trade missions that we led on behalf of the state with the governor. So again, my previous position came in handy that I'd worked for the governor, and now we were leading the delegations with the governor to go into these countries with business owners and to introduce them to that market and to help them expand and grow globally. Because at the end of the day, that helps Utah's economy grow. And so here's just a picture. We were in the Middle East, um, and... We had different opportunities. We, this, uh, the one on the left is at the, at the House of Lords in England. And, and then the one on the right is at a trade show um, where we took Utah companies to go and exhibit. The other great thing about that job was we, part of our mission was diplomacy. So building bridges. Because it helps Utah if the governor, who's the head of state, goes and interacts with these other countries' heads of state because then they are more interested and willing to help Utah businesses grow. And just as an aside, it's also really great for building relationships um, for Utah, for the church as well, globally. And so we, we often hosted foreign dignitaries at our offices, um, so any international heads of state that would come to visit or ambassadors or business delegations, we would host them and sometimes the governor was able to meet with them and sometimes not, but we would host them and introduce them to businesses here in the state and then when we went overseas we did that as well. Another exciting thing that um, I got to participate in was the starting of the Utah Inland Port. So I don't know if you've heard about that, but you know that we have such a global economy right now, and logistics are such a big part of getting goods across borders. And so a few years ago in Utah, they had the idea, you know, we're, we're landlocked as a state. We're not next to the ocean like California. We don't have ports with ships bringing goods back and forth across the ocean. But we can become a hub for international trade, even though we're landlocked, by creating a special area um, that is going to take all the goods that go through the ports and then allow them to go through customs here in our state and then redistribute. So um, that's an exciting thing that's still happening right now. It's called the Utah Inland Port and it hasn't, um, it, right now it's started, but they're still working on creating all of the different business plan items that need to go along to, to make it a reality. But I want you to think about um, all of the challenges in today's world. And I want you to look at those challenges and think of them as opportunities. Because every one of those challenges means it's an opportunity for you to be a problem solver or for you to be part of the solution. So I just have a, a few listed up here. Global affairs, America's leadership role, economic security, globalization and technology, defensive security. And think about what's been happening in these countries in the last few months. So the Middle East, a lot of conflict continually. Um, North Korea, the nuclear threats. China, right now we're dealing with coronavirus, which is impacting supply chains and trade and could create not only the health pandemic, but you can see that the stock market is starting to crash. I mean, lots and lots of um, factors involved. Russia and then the trade wars, which you know um, have been ongoing. Um, treaties and trade negotiations are huge to our economy, and diplomacy is part of that, very big part of that. So I want you to think about your world when you leave BYU and your time, where you're going to spend it. Your world can be your home. I hope that um, you know if you become a homemaker, and I, and I will say that could be a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad, because I do have friends from law school, males who ended up after law school, they're stay-at-home dads, and their wives are the career person. So whatever your situation is, whatever your path calls for, um, your home is your world. 
And I'm sure you know this just from everything that you've been taught, that how important uh, your home life and your family life is going to be to you. That's the most important thing besides anything else in this life, um, your home and your family. And then outside of your home and family, there's a lot of ways for you to contribute in your community. Um, you can participate and serve on boards. You can become involved in your um, cities, your local municipalities. There's your, the schools where your kids will attend. Um, there's lots of different opportunities to serve and work there. Um, and then the nation, the US. There are so many cool jobs out there that I became aware of when I worked for the World Trade Center. The U.S. Commercial Services, it's an, um, an entity of the U.S. Trade Department. And these U.S. Commercial Service officers, they can work within the United States or they can work overseas, and they help grow business relationships for U.S. American companies abroad. It's the coolest job. And so there's so many different things that you can go into um, on the national level. The Foreign Service, um, there's just a lot of really amazing opportunities out there for you. And then the world, your world. What does that world look like? If you served a mission um, overseas, you know, you may have that love and desire to help the people of the country where you served and to go back and, and start a business there or work for a business there or um, just so many different ways that you can become involved on a global level. And as I'm sure you're aware, we now live in a global economy. Um, technology and communication have changed everything. So contribute in your own way. Do meaningful work wherever you end up and make sincere connections to people and to the community and the world. And just a reminder that there is a great big world out there waiting for you. Don't get discouraged um, about, you know, it's hard to find a job or it's hard to get an internship or this isn't exactly the job you wanted or that's not the the salary you thought you would get. Don't be discouraged. Every little bit will help you get that preparation um, and land you where you need to be. And um, finally, I'm just going to share with you about my daughter that was, she graduated from UVU with her degree in political science. I just wanted to let you know about her um, path and how she landed the job that she has. How many of you know and use Amazon? Right? <laughs> well, she is currently on Amazon's policy team in Washington, D.C. So I'll tell you a little bit about how she got there. Uh, so she was a student at UVU, political science major, and she really wanted to get involved in elections and campaigns. She loves politics. So um, she was looking for opportunities to work and applying and couldn't find any opportunities to work. So I reminded her, you know what, a lot of times the best opportunities come because you volunteer first. So she said, great, I'm willing to volunteer. Well, it was during the time um, that Governor Herbert was running for re-election. And so I was able to connect her to somebody who uh, was the campaign manager for Governor Herbert. And he said, I can't offer you a job, but if you want to volunteer, I'll need you the full campaign season, which was full-time all summer and a little bit into the next semester, I think. And so she was like, oh, I really wanted to earn money this summer. You know how it is in college. Money's good, right? Um, it goes a long way. But she knew it would be a sacrifice to volunteer. Well, she decided to go ahead and sacrifice, and um, she would volunteer full-time and work part-time at night. So she did that and had a great experience on the campaign. Well, lo and behold, on the campaign, uh, she got to meet some really influential people. Um, and so when it came time for her to do an internship, uh, she chose Washington, D.C. So she got an internship, and she worked really hard there. Again, not her first choice internship. Um, something that it was a tax, I think it was Americans for Tax Reform, something like that, but she didn't know anything about tax policy and didn't care about tax policy, but she did care about um, criminal justice. And so they said, we'll let you be a writer on our blog for criminal justice issues. And she thought, great. So again, not ideally what she wanted, but it was something. So she worked really hard at that internship. And when she, when it came time to graduate, because she had made such good connections and relationships and had volunteered on the campaign, had her DC experience, she was able to 
land a job right out of college in Senator Mike Lee's office in DC. And so she was on his staff um, and she had a great experience there on his staff, um, really thoroughly enjoyed it, but again, worked really hard. Um, and then that led to Amazon's out in DC now in Virginia and they approached her, a recruiter contacted her. Um, so just remember that um, it's not always a straight line to get to the ideal or you know whatever your career path is, but be willing to do the things that others aren't willing to do because it will eventually land you where you want to be. So um, I think now we're ready for questions. Um, if you, any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer, but I'll hopefully know where you can find the answer. Because doubt, I think, affects everyone. I don't know anybody that's that super uber confident. Maybe there are some people, but for the majority of us, we all start to doubt things. Like I'll, I'll share with you, I doubted for a long time why I chose to get a degree in English. And later I saw, you know what, that's helped me with communication skills, with writing skills. It helped the literature part just helps tremendously with, you know, being able to absorb a lot of material. Then I wondered, okay, what um, what was the purpose of getting a master's degree in educational leadership? And I didn't end up there. Again, that was one of the reasons why BYU was able to contact me and say, hey, we typically hire PhDs, but you're a practitioner working in the field and you have a master's degree, so we want to hire you. So then I realized, okay, that was for that next reason. Um, same thing with law, you know, doubting the whole time because I went to law school with classmates who knew exactly what type of law they were going to practice and they knew exactly what firms they wanted to work for. I had no clue. I just knew I'm supposed to be here and I'm supposed, there's some work for me to do afterwards. And um, it's frightening, right? It's frightening because you're investing not only your money but your time into things and you don't know how it's going to turn out. Um, and then in each of my jobs, there's doubt. Like right now, as an attorney, I deal with people's worst crises. They call me when they're in crisis mode, and it's always urgent. Like the state is going to shut them down, and they need me to appeal their case to keep their business open. Or somebody is suing them for several thousands of dollars. Or my client, I'm suing on their behalf a very high-profile person that you know I don't want to lose for them. So there's always doubt. Um, but I think the way, the best way that I've found to deal with it is um, going to the temple regularly, commit to it. You will never have the extra time to go to the temple. You will never have the extra time to read your scriptures. And you will never have the extra time to, church, to serve in your church callings. So you just have to make a decision to be committed to it. And those three things I've done consistently, and I honestly feel that that is what has helped me stay closest to the Holy Ghost so that those times that I do doubt everything and I do wonder, am I failing at this? Am I failing at that? Is this going to lead to what I'm supposed to be doing? That's what keeps me going. Um, it was really tough being in law school and, and working as a single mom and doing all those things. And yet I found that when I made the time to go to the temple regularly and to always serve in whatever calling, I was asked to serve in that my life was so much better. My life was so much more blessed and the lives of my family were so much blessed. So I have a really, really strong testimony that um, those things will, will pull you through because you know what? Sometimes you're just going to need something or someone pulling you through because it gets tough. It really does. Good question. The most fulfilling. Okay. So on a... I'll say eternal perspective, spiritual perspective, it's definitely my family. You know what? Making them a priority, no matter how many demands you have from your employer or from the whatever else, making your family um, your priority, it will all work out. Um, so that's been the most fulfilling on that level, on an eternal spiritual level. Um, and a career-wise level, honestly, I would say anything that I get to have a touch point with um, solving problems is so fulfilling for me. That's my path. I love helping people. So right now, yesterday was a good day for me at work because I had two litigation cases and um, both of the other parties ended up offering to settle and my clients are going to get a lot of money. 
And so that's very fulfilling that I was able to help these people and it didn't go the other way where they were out a lot of money. Um, so whether it involves helping them through whatever type of crisis or just solving problems um, or even you know, the international work that I've done, knowing that I'm helping these Utah businesses grow because that business growth is going to lead to them hiring more people, more jobs for Utahns, and um, it's going to kind of increase the, increase the, the level of, of the economy here in the state, not only for that individual business owner, but for all their employees and their families can now have a livelihood that's more secure. Um, so I think for me, anything that I have a touch point with that helps people or solves problems or, or can um, do something like that is rewarding and fulfilling for me. But everyone has a different passion. Like my daughter that's in D.C., her passion truly is, you know, politics and policies. Um, so everyone has a different passion. So I do speak another language. I speak Spanish, and I will tell you, as you don't, you don't think of Spanish as being that universal, but in the Middle Eastern countries, guess what they spoke? Arabic and Spanish. So here I was leading these delegations, and I didn't speak Arabic, in, but they spoke Spanish, and so we were able to communicate. Um, so yeah, speaking another language is always super helpful. I, if I could, and if I had had the time during law school, because I know that the State Department offers the language courses, I would love to learn multiple languages. I have a sister who's a professor, and she speaks nine languages fluently. It's amazing. I would love that, because language is how you connect with people. It truly is. Um, but without all those language skills, um, the next best way to connect is to just let them know you care about them and that you're interested in them wherever you are in the world, um, caring about people and showing interest. You'll find ways to communicate and bridge that gap in language skills. So I think you're going to encounter a lot of options and choices when you work. When you, when you leave BYU and kind of um, the bubble that a lot of us are in, and you go out into the world, you're going to be faced with choices. And so you're either going to have to decide to stay grounded to your principles and your choices, whether it's being honest in business dealings, whether it's being chaste in business environments, whether it's keeping the word of wisdom, um, whether it's being true to your beliefs, whether it's being respectful of other people and their religions and their culture, Whatever um, those principles are that you hold dear to you, if you make that decision to keep those with you, you will. Throughout my career, I have seen so many people who fell away because it started off with something small. They're at, you know, the, we were served alcohol at all of these events. Um, and, you know, you have to say, no, thank you, and just take the water and explain to them, you know, this is why I don't drink alcohol or this is... No, I'm you know, not going to attend that event. I'm going to you know, return back to my hotel now, whatever it is. Um, you'll be faced with a lot, of, a lot of different views on what's OK and what's not OK. Um, so really, I think just holding fast to your beliefs and making that commitment, making that decision. Because when you're in the middle of it and it's, you're approached with it, it's too late then to decide and think, oh, should I, shouldn't I? Because people are pulled away very quickly. So if you make those decisions early on that you're going to stay committed to your, your values um, and your principles, then it makes it a lot easier. Yeah, temptation is real. Temptation is out there for everyone um, on a daily basis. Like I said, there are people that go into business and um, then they're dishonest and they end up you know, in jail. There are people who go into business and end up having affairs and they lose their family over it. There are people who start drinking casually at social events and end up addicted and um, it's just, there's a lot out there. That's the reality. And so every choice you can make on a daily basis I think is, is the best you can do to just stay strong and committed. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the best way to keep your testimony strong is just to do those simple things that we hear every day. Take the time to pray, take the time to read your scriptures, and take the time to serve in your church callings and, and go to the temple. Yeah. You need to think of, and I wish I had done this, um, think of your schooling as an investment. It's an investment of your money, or your parents' money, but also investment of your time. 
and I will say this, law school was the right decision for me. It opened up so many doors and continues to open up so many doors and opportunities. Um, but it isn't the right choice for everyone. I have friends that I went to law school with who aren't even practicing law now. They're doing something completely different. Like they were, one was a real estate agent before law school, went to law school, and now is back in real estate and killing it, right? Real estate market's been good for a few years. So um, it really, I, I think, you know, being prayerful about it and listening to the Holy Ghost. You know, you can call it listening to your gut, listening to inspiration, listening to promptings, but really being in tune to know what's right for you. Um, law school is a great education, but you know what? There are other things that could be a great education as well. And the work environment's a great education. If you put yourself into the right types of internships or jobs or opportunities, look for people who emulate the kind of um, habits and, and traits that you want to, to follow after and seek after those people and, and, and see what they did to get where they're at. That's always a good, good way to approach it. Balance is tough for all of you men in this room and all of you women. It is just tough for everyone. It's not an easy thing. Um, and a lot of times you're going to have to do the test, that good, better, best test, um, to really decide how you prioritize your time and how you manage your time. Um, I think at the end of the day, you're going to know what your family needs the most, more than anybody else, and you're going to know what your employer is seeking from you. And I always found that as long as I did a really good job for my employer and did quality work, they were more willing to be flexible with my time so that I could take care of my family. So once they knew I was going to do uh, you know, my best on whatever project I was working on, but I also needed to meet the needs of my family, then it always worked out. Um, there are a lot of demands on your time. There will, all, will always be a lot of demands on your time. And so it really does come down to you prioritizing what's most important and then making it happen. And um, I feel very fortunate that I worked with people who valued the work that I did enough to give me the time and the flexibility that I needed with my family. And you guys are in such a better position than I was in 20 years ago because technology has changed everything. So as I mentioned, um, our law firm is virtual. So all the attorneys, we work remotely. And technology has made it so easy that I can file things with the court online. I don't have to go to the courthouse to file um, papers in person anymore like we used to have to do. Um, I can communicate with clients on Google Meets or you know chats or whatever we need so that they don't have to come to my office or I don't have to go there. Um, so I can work from home now. And I think that there are so many new opportunities that you can create your own work environment to make it work for you and your family. Um, so it's not easy to balance, and there are going to be days that you will feel like a total failure. I want you to know that, and that's okay. <laughs> I want you to go out there knowing it's okay to fail, because sometimes you will. Um, but then you pick yourself up, and you say, okay, how can I do better at that? What do I need to change? And what do I need to adjust? And where can I make a, a switch? So.